In today's Ukraine Explainer, uh, I'm going to tackle the question of what's China's role in this? And it's an interesting question today, uh, Monday, March 14th, uh, because we've been seeing some stories uh, today to the, uh, uh, of the, to the effect that the United States government has announced that Russia has asked China uh, for weapons or to buy weapons from China and that the United States government has warned Russia, has warned China you know, not to sell weapons for this war. Um, to Russia. Um, so we want to dig into the question of if it's true, what does it imply? And then we'll look more broadly at, at Russia-China relations and at what the, the conflict might mean for China, because um, it's a good time to do that. Um, I want to start with a caveat, though, which is uh, I'm really a specialist on Ukraine and Russia and their relations with each other um, and the foreign policy of both those countries and to some extent politics within both those countries. I'm much less of an expert on China um, and Chinese foreign policy. Uh, I, th I think, um, you know, I've done enough homework and I've taught about these subjects over the years, so I'm not a completely non-credible source on Chinese foreign policy. But I do want to be uh, clear that I'm going to be a little more cautious here because it's really not my specialty. Um, so first, um, if this story is true that Russia is asking China uh, for weapons, um, what does that imply? And, and I'll start with just the caveat, which is if this is true, um, do we think the United States government could be lying? Um, well, I'll point out that so far, uh, everything the United States government has said about this conflict uh, has turned out to be quite true, um, even when a lot of people thought that it was highly inaccurate, you know, particularly in the predictions that Russia was going to invade. A lot of people were skeptical, and that turned out to be true. Um, but nonetheless, um, Information operations are important in conflict. Uh, Putin is a, is a master of, of information warfare and propaganda. And so we at least have to ask the question, is it possible that this is just, uh, um, you know, uh, some information operation? Well, why, why might it be? What would you get out of it? Well, actually, it says two pretty interesting things um, that would be interesting to do, you know, if it were a complete fabrication. One is it's kind of poking Russia, saying... Um, saying R Russia doesn't have the, the strength or the power to uh, carry this out. Um, the other thing it's saying, and this is really interesting, you know, uh, it's especially interesting if the story is true, but, but it's potentially interesting even if it's not, is it's saying that the United States intelligence agencies um, are able to, f to know what the Russia, uh, Russians and Chinese are saying to each other. And so you can imagine um, that there might be people in both Moscow and Beijing wondering, how, how is it that they know uh, what we're saying? Or do they know what we're saying? And if so, how? Is it them or is it us? Is it a spy or is it a, a, a technical thing? And, and so it's, um, you, you can imagine it, it creating quite a, um, a problem for both those sides. But for the time being, uh, let's take the story at, at uh, something at face value and assume that there's some truth in it. What would it mean if, if Russia were asking to buy weapons uh, from China? Well, I think somewhat obviously it would mean that they're running short on something, although um, we don't know exactly what. There have already been some signs of this. Um, it's been noticed for really from the beginning of the invasion that uh, Russia was not using uh, as many precision-guided mu uh, munitions as, as some thought, and there was speculation that they may already have used up a lot of these munitions in Syria and didn't want to completely run out in case something else comes up. Um, the slow progress we've seen in the north, uh, that is to say those columns of, of vehicles headed towards Kiev, uh, has, has raised what, what looks to most analysts like a logistics problem. Um, in particular, I read something from uh, War on the Rocks, which is a, a great website, um, at, well before the conflict started, pointing out that the, the, the analyst uh, that was pointing this out said they, they didn't think Russia had enough trucks uh, to really uh, supply uh, an invasion like this once it got, uh, you know, really uh, any kind of significant distance from Russia's borders. Uh, we don't I exactly know, but, but it is a good time to bring up a, a classic old line about war, which is that when it comes to war and, and discussing war, that the amateurs talk about strategy and the professionals talk about logistics. Um, so the implication, at least, of this report is that Russia is having material problems, supply problems. And, and that could be immensely significant, right? If you look for scenarios by which Russia loses this war, most people believe that, that you know, if, if Russia's got the, 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 the weapons, um, you know, it's got the tanks, it's got all this stuff, um, that it's going to defeat Ukraine. Um, there are really sort of two arguments that people have put out there about why Russia might not succeed. One of those would be just the morale of its troops collapses, 
Um, and the other would be that some really important supply, trucks might be one of them, um, you know, ends up, uh, uh, that they end up being in, in, in short supply of it. We'll see. We'll see about that. But let's turn now and talk more broadly about China. Um, would China help if Russia came asking for um, weapons? Uh, that gets us to uh, the, the, the broader, what's Russia's position in this war? But let's start specifically with this weapons question. Um, I think the answer is China would almost certainly not help. Um, and, and it would not help because China has so far been able to stay completely aloof from this conflict, really just saying some things on the sideline. Uh, and I don't think it wants to get in a situation where it could potentially become the target for Western sanctions. Um, so in a nutshell, I do think it just comes down to China not wanting potentially um, to, to be the target of, of sanctions. It's worth pointing out that economically, in terms of exports, not in terms of anything it has to have, but in terms of exports and export markets, China actually is, is probably more dependent overall on the West than Russia is. Uh, China's economy has boomed over the last 30 years, selling stuff you know, in North America, in Europe, and around the world, and they don't want to see anything disrupt that. And it would really be an economic problem if something disrupted that. Um, China's approach to the war more broadly has been to try to have it both ways, or, or really to try to take a neutral position um, and, and let the U.S. Uh, and Russia, or Ukraine and Russia, or Western Europe and Russia slog it out. Uh, what, they've been, what they've been saying is, fairly consistently, is that the United States is at fault uh, for expanding NATO, um, so China, of course, likes to say that things are the United States' fault, um, but it hasn't explicitly endorsed Russia's uh, invasion or said that Russia is right to invade. What it said is, you know, the, the U.S. is fault for uh, the U.S. is at fault for expanding NATO, and we think um, there should be peace, right? So they've taken that kind of neutral, non-position position, right? Who could be against peace? Um, it's easy to be a, be for peace, right? The hard part is to say who should stop doing what they're doing. Um, or who should get what they want and who should, and who should not get what they want. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of been the position, and one doesn't see why China would necessarily want to veer too, too much from that. Um, and so a related question then to ask is, is this war then good for China? Is it bad for China? Uh, where does China stand in all of this? And I think there are three schools of thought, at least that I've been able to figure out, and two of them are kind of related to one another. Um, the, this, probably the the most uh, widely shared view that I've been able to see is that this is good for China. Uh, the New York Times ran an article along these lines, I think it was today, that basically said, you know, uh, we don't really know exactly who's going to win this war except for China, right? China wins this war. Um, the argument is that it distracts the United States, it weakens the United States. Uh, you, ch the United States for years has talked about pivoting towards, to, to, to giving more attention towards East Asia. And it seems like here's another thing that's come along that's going to distract the United States from that for months, if not years. And that seems good for China. Um, there's also an argument that making, that making Russia weaker um, is good for China because to the extent that they do have a relationship with one another, it'll make uh, uh, Russia more of the junior partnership in that, in that relationship. And we'll, we'll try to come back to that question. Um, I think there's a second view, a slightly more nuanced view, which is this is potentially good for China. Uh, in the ways that I just said, as long as China can keep from getting dragged in. Um, and so China really has to uh, manage its diplomacy so that it doesn't be seen as, a, as, as, as um, favoring one side or the other, or, or there could be some really negative consequences. Uh, and then there's a third view that says this is actually terrible for China. Um, and that view focuses, again, on China as an exporter and China as a country that has benefited immensely from the um, openness of the world economy over the last uh, 30 years, and in particular, the, the fact that the United States and Western Europe was uh, happy to deal with Russia strictly, uh, I'm sorry, to deal with uh, China strictly in economic terms without really thinking about the security implications. And of course, that's been changing now, and the argument is that this is going to, to um, accelerate. In that view, the, the tendencies we've already seen, largely due to COVID and the supply chain shortages that have come out of that, is that companies all over the world and governments all over the world are suddenly not so sanguine about the effects of globalization and that there's going to be a big effort to bring more manufacturing back home. Not only in the sense of strategy, you don't necessarily want foreign powers making your semiconductors and your, and your computer software, um, 
but also in the sense of managing supply chains. It's just this has been too complicated um, and too difficult to manage supply chains uh, coming all the way from Asia. And to the extent that that is the driving thought in coming years, right, uh, China's export uh, opportunities will be limited. And so to summarize, there's a sense that this is uh, bad because it's um, leading or it's accelerating a process that was already underway towards deglobalization, which is uh, something that China has benefited immensely from and would probably continue to benefit from. Uh, so last thing I might say is just a little bit about, about China-Russia relations. Um, and this is something I, I have done some work on um, because we, we spend some time on it in the class I teach on Russian foreign policy. And uh, to, to be fairly brief about this, I think there's a very small number of people that see Russia and China as having a real alliance in the future. Uh, I think more generally what people see is that they're likely to have some set of common interests, largely because they have common adversaries, the United States, um, but that they also have enough uh, interests that are not really totally in line with one another, such as uh, they're actually competing for influence in Central Asia, right? Uh, the areas of, of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and so on, um, that they're, which really lie sort of between Russia and China and that they're competing. There's also the fact that um, China and, and Russia share a very long border, which... Uh, in the past has been the subject of conflict, um, not only when Russia was still an imperial power and, and China was still being exploited by imperial powers, but also in 1970, there was actually a border skirmish between Russia and, and China um, because they were two big powers vying for who was going to be the leader of, of global communism. Well, the, the, the leader of global communism issue really doesn't divide them anymore. Um, but there's also a minority viewpoint that says in the long run, China and uh, Russia are destined not to be um, um, allies, but adversaries. I think the long run, you know, this all just gets into the realm of, of speculation. Um, but what's important, I think, for our purposes uh, today is to think that both in, in Beijing and in Moscow, they're thinking about this relationship and thinking about what it's uh, going to look like. And there's both sort of some hopes about how it might turn out, but there's some real um, fears in, in, in both capitals um, as well. And so as far as China really becoming an ally of Russia in the sense of helping them fight this war, I don't think they either have the interest in terms of helping Russia that much, um, but they also have a powerful disincentive in, form, in the form of potential uh, Western reaction. And so I think that's uh, where things stand for right now. So even if this report, uh, or assuming that this report of Russia asking China for to sell it some weapons is true, um, I think that at least in the short to medium term, uh, China's unlikely to help them out.